And these two questions, in fact, they are uh, related. So as I told you, um, language is reasonably easy for children to learn. And this, despite just the fact that they uh, observe like a tiny subset of uh, what language can express, but they get it right. So that suggests that there is a relation uh, between the mechanism that children use to acquire language and the structure of language itself. So the question has been, what's the origin in fact um, of that link? And one prominent view was to say that, okay, humans evolved um, a set of brain mechanism, which are specialized for language. Um, sometimes people use the term even like generative grammar, uh, even if they don't talk only about grammar. Um, sometimes they say um, language faculty, um, which is a bit weird uh, from a terminological point of view. Um, I could talk about it for uh, five more minutes, but that's not, that's not the point right now. Uh, anyway, the, the view here is to say that there, is, uh, there might be a domain specific cognitive module that is dedicated to language that is innate, and that can explain a great deal about language learning and the structure of language. And the justification for that type of position um, can come into two parts. First is to say that, well, um, language is too complex, in fact, for a child to acquire, and the input does not uh, contain sufficient evidence for the child to, to learn the system. So you have to assume like a prior knowledge of language um, for the child to be able to, in fact, um, uh, decrease, uh, tame down the number of possible hypotheses for the target language. And um, in fact, there had been a very rich literature that provided counter argument for this view. In particular, um, some research that uncovered that um, the input is in fact quite rich. And I think this was most obvious in Steve's talk from last week, that there is a certain amount of language knowledge, um, at least that can be seen at the, at the behavioral level that can be achieved by just word prediction models. So which do not have any prior assumption of what um, language may look like. Of course, this is not a model of language learning, actually not yet, uh, because the amount of data this uh, language model need, uh, this is not at all like comparable to the child um, at the point of now. And then we also may not agree on the kind of representation that this model achieve, um, uh, that, is, that is this mental representation in any way similar to what humans have. But um, I think this is nonetheless striking that there is information available, in fact, in, in, in this type of model that is richer than uh, perhaps what has been previously uh, presupposed. Um, finally, as uh, far as children um, language learning is concerned, when we say input, there is actually much more than the language they receive, right? Um, and this is something also that I think Steve has mentioned last week, which is that infants and children, they learn from more than just the linguistic inputs, okay? They, they learn uh, from a rich social setting, and this is certainly uh, supporting um, language acquisition. So the word is like rich in information, but on top of that, there are also so many studies that show that children are smart learners. So um, they can use, in fact, um, the richness of the input. So for instance, toddlers, they can learn about the meanings of individual words from the structure uh, and the semantics of sentence in which these words are occurring. Um, they can encode like similarities between words, uh, depending on where they are found. Um, in a sentence, and they can use the social cues that they have at disposal. They also have a sophisticated learning mechanism, which is grounded in social cognition. So much like what we do as adults when we process speech, we are trying to infer what is being talked about. Um, so it's not the case that um, infants are just passive, passively absorbing the input. There is more and more research showing that they're actively making sense uh, of what's going on. So on the view that the, the, the view, in fact, that language is complex and that the evidence is too little has really been taken seriously uh, by a good amount, of, in fact, of experimental and modeling work that show that, in fact, well, the input is rich and that learners are smart so that they can actually um, leverage some inferential mechanism to learn from it. Um, the second argument that has been advanced for language-specific constraint is that while um, we found some kind of um, um, 
recurrent patterns in language structure, these patterns are actually uh, arbitrary in the sense that they are not motivated by any function. So in order to be able to learn this pattern and to see this pattern across unrelated language, well, you need to appeal some of some kind of like innate um, knowledge. And there have been also here uh, um, a very rich line of research looking at this argument in the last couple of years. And they basically show that some universal or like a uh, recurring pattern in the, lang in the language are shaped by communicative or learning pressure. So that is to say that these properties make um, language more efficient from uh, communicative or uh, uh, a learning perspective. Um, there is also other research, and um, uh, a lot of this research is done uh, in Edinburgh that show that uh, the, the properties of language, um, such as, for instance, like compositionality, which is like a deep uh, architectural property, uh, might emerge through repeated ep uh, episodes of language um, transmission and learning, so through our um, cultural evolution uh, of language. And, and what I want to point out with all of this very uh, quick summary uh, is that we may not need a strong in a linguistic principle in the brain um, to explain uh, language. Of course, this was, as I said, a very rough summary for introductory purpose. And in fact, the details of all of this study um, that I quickly uh, mentioned here are important. And to be clear, uh, I, I'm not here um, discarding the possibility of any uh, linguistic constraint. I'm just illustrating that, in fact, what all this research is showing us is that there may be less innateness that is necessary for explaining language learning and language in general than what has been uh, initially presupposed. Okay, that's it. It doesn't mean that there are no biological foundation at all. I think that just by talking all the time about um, universal grammar, um, we kind of forget that by rejecting everything that is innate, we do not provide a very accurate account of how um, the language faculty, the capacity for language might have evolved, which is really what is at stake here when we speak about language acquisition and about language structure. And it would be certainly surprising to find that language and all of its properties just evolve like de novo like this um, in humans. Um, and the hypothesis that uh, I, my group, and other groups also uh, are having is that um, some language property may just come from processes that were already in place because, before, in fact, language kicked in, um, from just the way we make sense of the word uh, through our senses or how we perceive the word and the mental representation that might result from this. And so in order to just understand better the foundation of language and language development, uh, one way is to take a comparative approach to actually study these capacity, which are similar to component of language across uh, a range of non-human uh, animal species, actually to understand how these properties of language might have come up. And that's the approach uh, that is currently taken by my lab, um, where we focus mainly on the semantic property of language, um, trying to answer um, the question of how much of semantics and semantic computation can be explained by um, non-linguistic uh, cognition by taking a comparative approach. Um, so what I'm going to show you uh, today is a set of studies that tap into this question, focusing on certain properties of um, language semantics. Um, starting uh, with lexical meanings. So um, one of the of the first question that we may have is whether, well, the set of lexical meanings that we see realized in language could be explained by general properties of cognition. And we are going to focus on one particular property of lexical meaning, uh, which is connectedness, which is a, a property um, that uh, is shared by all words uh, in the lexicon. So what's connectedness? Uh, so I'm giving you here like a very rough uh, definition of, uh, of it. So we say that the meaning of a word is connected if um, I can call an object A um, as a bliquet, an object C as a bliquet. Um, suppose that I take an object B that is in between A and C in some type of like conceptual space, then that means that B is also a bliquet. 
What this means is that there is no gap uh, in the meaning of words. So meanings are something that is that are well formed, like this blob here, and that cannot correspond to that type of uh, figures here. Um, if we look cross linguistically, we found no content word that would mean something like dog or mushroom, but not warm, assuming that worm is something like, which is between a dog and a mushroom. Um, table or sofa, but not chair, blue or red, but not purple. Okay, so that, that, that seems to indicate that this general constraint are content words. Um, there is also experimental evidence that um, human adults and children have a bias for connected meanings when they are uh, learning words. And a good illustration of that is some work by Xu and uh, Tenenbaum that um, I'll just summarize uh, briefly here. So suppose that this is a set of things uh, in your world and that these taxonomic trees represent your conceptual space. So you have different dogs here and they are close together, they form like a subtree. Um, you have mammals here that forms like a bigger subtree and so on. And each node here in the tree um, could be potentially um, labeled with the word. So if these three dogs are shown to you and label blickets, um, well, children and adults actually will generalize this word to uh, 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 the, the word blicket to all here the, the bassets, which I think is, is this type of dog, but to none of the uh, other objects which are presented here. If this time uh, the free blicket objects in fact span a larger set of dogs, then blicket will be understood as dog. And again, if the free blicket objects span a larger set of animals, then blicket will be understood as animal. So what children and adults are doing is that they generalize the word to the minimal subtree that includes all the exemplars, which is actually what's the connectedness constraint is about. Like all these um, examples, all these objects which are in between are also applicable. So connectedness may be an active constraint during like language acquisition. So learners would be biased to search for connected meaning and that bias would translate um, at the level of the lexicon. And so we may ask the following question, okay, is this bias for connectedness be found independently of language? Is this something that other species would share? Um, so we focus um, on non-human animals, of course, and we focus on another type of words, logical words. So animals, of course, because they do not have a language as we know it, so we need that to answer that question. And we focus on, on quantifier because um, that is not something that animal communicative systems are granted with. Okay, so if they, they do show connectedness for something that is similar to quantifier, that's not because of um, their language. And so quantifiers are actually uh, the same as content words in terms of uh, connectedness. There is a connectedness constraint that applies on quantifier. Sometimes we, uh, you would see the word monotonicity, but you can basically uh, think of them as the same thing. Formally, they are, they are, they are very similar to one another, and we, we have shown that in a theoretical paper. Um, but for that matter here, I'm just giving you uh, what it means for a quantifier to be connected or not connected. So a connected quantifier would be something like more than five or between uh, three uh, and five, so which are like connected blobs uh, on the numeric um, dimension. And non-connected quantifier would be something like three or seven or outside of uh, three and five. So four would be outside of it, therefore it's not um, connected here. Um, Okay, and so uh, the experiment that I'm uh, with animals that I'm going to present you uh, today, and we are trying to extend that to to other models. But our first models is the uh, animal model is the guinea baboon, and they, all these experiments they take place at the CNRS primate center uh, uh, of uh, of Jose in my lab. Uh, so it, it's a it's a setup where you have uh, baboons that are living uh, and their group in their enclosure, and you see that there were test boots at the back of their of their enclosure. And whenever they want, um, they can come uh, in the test booth, and they have a monkey setup where they can put their hands, and they can also uh, see uh, a screen. 
uh, that's a touch screen and they can provide a response to like some um, trials experiment um, that we show them. So they get a food reward uh, uh, when they are correct and when they are incorrect, um, they get a little, that's a, uh, an incorrect response, the green screen, that's a timeout. Uh, so all the experiment that I'm going to show you uh, today uh, with the baboons, they use uh, they use that setup. Okay, so uh, coming back to a question of connectedness, uh, what we will test here is whether baboons find it easier to learn a connected quantifier like rule than a non-connected quantifier like rule. So the experiment goes like this: first, um, they would see a display um, that they have to categorize as a or uh, B. The displays are six stimuli um, that are circle, which are characterized by the proportion of colors. So from 0% of purple to 100% purple. And the task here is to categorize half of the stimuli as A and half of the stimuli as B, and we ma manipulate, in fact, what is A and B depending on the condition. So here, in the connected condition, all the stimuli um, that correspond uh, to A uh, are all contiguous in that dimension of a proportion of, of purple. And in the non-connected condition, you see that the three stimuli associated with A are spread non-continuously, and similarly, the three stimuli associated with B. Um, the monotone condition, you can think about it um, as an extreme version of connectedness where uh, both A and B, in fact, are continuous. Okay, so that's connected as well. So the hypothesis here is that Bourbon should be uh, should be faster to learn connected patterns than non-connected patterns is they have this type of like connectedness uh, bias. So these are the results. So that's the number of blocks of trial which are needed to reach the learning criterion. And what you see is that baboons find easier to learn connected patterns than non-connected patterns. So that suggests that this type of bias for connectedness may have non-linguistic roots. And this has kind of uh, uh, um, um, okay, wait, let me say one word about it. So in fact, the, the, the reason why um, uh, some meanings like um, dog or animal would seem like more natural to us um, than some meanings like animal, but no dog or dog or mushroom, it has nothing to do with language per se. It just seems like to be a general uh, propensity, in fact, to like uh, connected patterns uh, over um, non-connected patterns and even in the non-linguistic domain. So consequences of that. Well, at the level of lexicon, it uh, suggests that there is a general uh, domain general constraint of meaning. Um, for learning, um, the consequence for that is that, well, connectedness would reduce the number of hypotheses for the word because you don't have to think about animal but no dog. And that actually justify, in a way, that prior for connectedness that uh, is there, it, every word learning models, but it's always uh, very implicit in the models. There is such a bias and it's even documented so in a, um, a non-human species. Um, and of course, the, the idea here is to extend this approach, in fact, to um, other lexical properties that has been uh, that has been targeted as um, semantic universal. So I'm thinking about conservativity, for instance, uh, in the domain of quantifier, which is quite interesting because there have been like conflicting uh, results uh, on uh, conservativity, um, conservative quantifier being easier to learn than non-conservative um, quantifier. Okay, so that was it for lexical meaning. So once we have lexical meaning, um, we can do uh, something that we call compositionality, which is the basic semantic computation that we find in language. So the definition of this is that uh, the meaning of an expression uh, is determined by the meaning of its part and uh, how they are um, just combined. And the question we may ask is that, okay, is compositionality uh, found in um, non-linguistic minds? Um, so, uh, and we can start by asking the question for uh, human infants. 
and in, even in France, this has been uh, surprisingly uh, not uh, very investigated. Uh, one exception is a study um, uh, by Steve that I'm just going to briefly uh, summarize here, uh, which tested infants' ability to track um, two object transformation mentally. So it goes like this. Uh, kids, uh, infants are familiarized with uh, a, a display where you have an object that goes into uh, a pipe, so they don't see the object uh, anymore. And you have one of these two, uh, like, here, um, function or operator that is applied on the pipe. When it's the spotted operator that is applied on the pipe, the object comes out being spotted. When it's the red operator, then the object comes out to be red. Okay, so they learn this function independently. And at test, um, uh, they are tested on um, the application of these two operators. So you have the red and the spotted operators that are applied, uh, wherever the objects come out as being red and spotted, as if you would expect if they correctly compose um, the result, um, the, sorry, the two, these two functions. The object would come up as only red, as if only the first uh, operator has been applied, or would come up as only spotted, as if uh, only the second operator would be applied. That's a violation of expectation task. That is to say that uh, we expect children or infants to look less to the outcome that um, they predicted. So if they are able to correctly compose the two operators, they should look less in the correct compositional case than in the other cases. And so these are the results, and that's not really what happened. Uh, the case where they look less are the case where the output is as if the second function uh, uh, has been uh, applied. So that might suggest, in fact, that um, nine months old infant cannot compose um, two events uh, like this. So it suggests it hints at the computational uh, limitation. As always, uh, with infant study, we may wonder, OK, is that really a computational limitation, or is it this something which is just linked uh, linked to the task? Um, the, the, the difficulty, in fact, in that task is that um, we need to teach them actual function, actual operation that has been applied. It's not really natural that, okay, if you have an object that goes through a pipe, you apply something red on the pipe and the objects come out red. That needs some learning. And perhaps simplifying the task would just um, do the trick. So that's what we tried here. Uh, we tried to go to a domain uh, that is familiar to children and infants, which is the domain of physical relations. So we don't have to teach them functions, actually. They, 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 they would come up with the output of the function by themselves. And so uh, Lisbeth keep provided evidence of what she called this core knowledge in physics. So uh, physical reasoning would use like a solidity constraint. So uh, infants from three months of age, they know that objects move only when they pass is unobstructed. So that means to say that if you have a stage like this one, um, you cover it um, by an occluder, then a ball is, ro is, is rolling, you uncover the stage, you expect the ball to be stopped by the first wall it encountered like this, and you're surprised if you find the ball here, as if it passes through the wall. Actually, in like two to three months old, I are surprised for that. And so we can ask the question of, okay, can infants compose two physical events, uh, right, predict the outcome of two physical events that I applied one after another without them seeing the intermediary uh, result after the first function? And so that's what we tried here. Uh, so we have a, a, an arbitration task uh, where uh, children are are habituated to that type of uh, uh, of of display where you have like a ball rolling behind an occluder and stopped by a wall. Okay, so it's exactly like the least bad key uh, type of study. Um, so once they're habituated to that, we present them by uh, a test event, which is the correct composition of two events. So similarly as before, we have the endpoint going, the occluder, then that's the first event. Boop. We have a ball rolling. Second event, a wall falling. We uncover, okay, 
the ball of the cylinder is at uh, its correct position. If you want the, the temporal course of that, that goes like this. Event A is the ball rolling. Then you have event B, the uh, wall falling. And that's the correct composition of the two events because you saw that there was enough time for the ball to roll uh, until its end point before that second wall fell. So that's the correct compositional uh, case. We uh, also present them to an incorrect compositional case that goes like this. Uh, so we place the occluder and the point. First, we have a wall falling. Then we have the ball rolling. And then we uncover and, uh oh, that's weird. Uh, so if, if you want to have the temporal ordering of that, we just basically just swap the uh, the, the events. So we first started with even B, the wall falling, and then after with even uh, A, um, the ball uh, is rolling. Um, so that's actually a kind of a sophisticated, if you want, compositional case, because here it's not that you have to process uh, A and B additively, okay? The order of the event actually matter for predicting um, the output. And so we, uh, we hypothesize that if uh, infants at nine months old are able to correctly predict um, the outcome of two physical events, they should look more in the incorrect compositional case than in the correct compositional case. Um, and that's what we found. We found that nine months old show behavior that is consistent with correct prediction of event composition. They look more in the incorrect case than in the uh, correct case. So, that suggests that nine months old can compose mental representations if you put them in a situation where they actually don't have to learn uh, uh, these functions. You put them in a situation where the functions are known, uh, such as in the physical domain. Now, what about animals? Okay, so the first thing that we might want to look at is whether we can find compositionality in animal communication system, because if we find it, well, that becomes quite natural to say that animals can compose mental representation. Um, but what um, this literature um, is currently pointing at is what there is actually plenty of evidence that animals can combine signal together. Um, there is very little evidence of composition. So I, I'm not going to detail all this. But I think it's worth noting that um, even if we don't find composition in an animal community system, uh, this does not mean that they cannot do it, right? Because they could be very well able to compose mental representation, but this capacity may not just be realized in their um, communicative system. Uh, other relevant studies for the, the, the question of compositionality are um, trained apes um, studies where um, apes in the 70s and in the 80s have been raised like uh, small humans. Um, it has been shown that they were able, in fact, to learn uh, quite a, a, a sizable lexicon uh, of words or of signs, uh, depending on the study. But in fact, they did not show the ability to combine um, these words or these signs uh, together in a productive way. Um, that's a bit what this graph uh, is showing here. So that's the average sentence length uh, uh, by age uh, uh, for um Nim was one of these trained ape, and you see that basically the sentence length is just like staying um, the same one or two uh, words or signs put uh, together. While you see that uh, these are two infants, human infants, they, they have a dramatic increase uh, of the sentence length. There is also uh, no evidence for compositionality uh, in some of the type of experimental tasks that tap into logical reasoning. So these tasks, they ask um, participants whether participants, in fact, can work out uh, a reasoning by exclusion. So I have option A or B. I say not B, therefore it's A. Uh, and the ability, in fact, to go through that, that type of reasoning would actually uh, suggest that animal could re can, can reason compositionally because it involves the manipulation of a functional operator like negation, which is a prime case, in fact, of compositionality. Uh, but to date, in fact, there is no evidence um, that non-human animals um, 
have the capacity to operate negation in this reasoning by exclusion task. So I'm going to give you two uh, examples. One is about like mutual exclusivity type of study. Um, so um, this is uh, Rico, it's a border collie who knows like many words. And the task was to present him with uh, a familiar object for which he has a label, so a ball, and to present with it uh, a novel object and ask him for, for the dax. And what he does is like he, he, he gives a, uh, the novel object. So this task seems to be relevant, in fact, um, for negation because one may think, okay, um, that DAX, DAX is not a ball because uh, that's a ball, that's called a ball, therefore it has to be um, the novel object. But in fact, here um, there is an alternative because there is no need to invoke negation in that task. One could just solve it by just mapping the novel uh, label to the novel object without, in fact, needing to go through an inference um, that is using negation. And that's what actually uh, what infants have been shown to be uh, doing uh, earlier. Another type of um, relevant task are the cup task. So in that task, um, animals are presented with uh, two, two cup, two options, so A or B. Then you have one food item that is hidden in one of the of the of the two of the two cups. One cup is revealed to be empty, and so the animals have been found uh, to look into the non-empty cup. The, yeah, the non-empty cup. So you have A or B, um, not B, therefore A. Um, this inference here uh, seems to be uh, using negation. But uh, again here, it's not necessarily about, in fact, negation at all, because it's not clear um, that animals have built some kind of logical relation between the presence of a food item and the absence of food item. So you could like probably all two separate representation of presence, absence, and absence not necessarily mean not present, if you want. So that could be something very different from A and not A, where you do have that logical relation. So this is just to show you that there is no evidence for compositionality in logical reasoning uh, task even. And more generally, compositionality uh, everywhere uh, appears to be uh, limited. And I think one last very neat illustration of that is uh, an experiment that has been done uh, in my lab by Joe Fago with the, the baboon, where they investigated whether uh, baboons could learn the meaning of individual symbol and later understand the meaning of novel combination of these uh, symbols. So quite targeting directly uh, compositionality. So here, what they did is that they taught um, baboons to associate the letter H to crosses and the letter Z to purple, so the color purple. Once they have learned this arbitrary um, association, they are tested on the composition of these two symbols. So they are presented with HD, and um, they measured whether baboons were more likely to pick the purple cross than any other item. And baboons, they just failed in that. They completely failed. No baboons succeeded in that. Um, so this does not provide evidence at all of compositionality. It's actually a hint towards a computation and computational limitation. But again, we may wonder here whether um, this is really a computational limitation or whether, as with the infants, this task is actually too complex because here, again, we need to like teach them arbitrary association between a symbol and a feature, and that uh, might just prevent them from succeeding in like more uh, difficult steps uh, in that task. So we actually tried, um, much like we did with the infants, to simplify this task maximally um, to test uh, whether they could compose in simpler settings. So uh, the task that we propose to Baboon is to learn Q object associations with two important simplifications that I will explain to you a bit later on. So uh, first in this task, Baboon see a centered Q, then they have a response choice between uh, two different options and they receive feedback 
food reward when they are correct, when incorrect, they receive a time. Um, the, in the first phase, they have to learn two pairs of Q. So these are the two pairs. So in one pair of Q here, you have what we call the atomic Q, okay, which associate with the identity. So when they see the wind turbine, it associates with the wind turbine uh, in the response choice. And you have a compositional Q, which is made up of um, the atomic Q, plus you see these four uh, crosses here, what we call the visual, uh, we'll call it the visual negative uh, morpheme here, which uh, this compositional Q associate to the complement set. So the objects that are not the wind turbine. Okay. Um, and there are two simplifications. I told you about two simplifications here. Um, the first is that um, learning of individual symbol here is made easier uh, because it's not arbitrary, okay? It's, it's, it's based on the relation of identity. Um, and the composition here uh, is using negation and it's not using like two um, previously learned symbol. Uh, and we think that Actually, using negation might just be easier because it's uh, supposedly like a potential primitive operation that might be available. Okay, so once they have learned this, uh, we present them uh, with a new pair of Q that uh, actually follow the same compositional rules as the previous uh, pairs. So you have the atomic Q that maps onto the identity. You have the compositional Q that maps onto the complement set here. So we present them whether uh, in this case or um, the other case where it's an incorrect uh, composition, where this time you cannot apply the compositional rule that you learned previously because um, the uh, atomic cues is associated to the uh, to the complement set, and the compositional cue is this time associated with the identity. So we just reverse um, the association uh, compared to the correct compositional keys. So uh, we predict that if participants they learn the meaning of the atomic cues and they learn how this meaning is systematically modified by this negation morpheme, they should find, in fact, the incorrect compositional uh, condition more difficult than the correct compositional case because um, the compositional rule does not apply here. Okay, And if they just wrote learn everything, we should just not see any difference between conditions. Um, so these are uh, the the result. Uh, so that's the number of blocks of trial which I needed to reach um, the learning criteria. And you see that baboons are much faster in the correct uh, composition condition than the incorrect one. So they are faster to learn a generalization of these compositional rules when it's applied to a new pair uh, of, of, of cues than when they are asked to learn, in fact, the, the reversed association. Um, for such a new pair. So it suggests, in fact, that baboons have learned to associate the negation morpheme with some type of negative function and apply that function to the embedded um, atomic cube. So just to sum up um, on all of that, so uh, what I showed you some time ago, a uh, nine months old infant can compose mental representation and Bourbon seems to respond to negation-like operator. I'm not making a big deal about whether that's negation or not um, negation. Uh, what I'm, uh, I'm just interested in here is that that operator seems to be uh, applied compositionally here, whether that's logical negation is another, uh, another story. Uh, so this has important consequences because this is evidence that mental representation can compose in the absence of language uh, and beyond uh, humans. Uh, but of course, this evidence is limited to a single uh, connective, which was like negation, and uh, to a single domain. So it would be great to see like what's the the the, the spread of that of that type of uh, compositional ability that uh, infants and uh, baboons could have. So that was it for uh, compositionality. Now turning to word order, which you will see might very well depend on the order of actually compositional operation. 
So um, across languages, we see that there are recurrent word order patterns. One example is what happened uh, within the noun phrase. So how you order the noun, the adjective, the numeral, and um, the demonstrative. So if you see a picture like this one um, in English, you would describe it as these two purple horses. And in Thai, you would say something, horses, purple, two, these. Well, you would order the lexical elements for Thai and disorder. And so Greenberg uh, has proposed by seeing uh, uh, a few of these languages that if the demonstrative, the numeral, and the adjective um, precedes the noun, um, they will be exactly in that order. Uh, uh, and if they follow the noun, they will be uh, in the opposite order. So exactly like the Thai and the English pattern. The picture is in fact a bit more complicated than this because if you look at the larger um, language sample than Greenberg, what you see is that there are many order which are possible. So these are the 24 possible order. And here you have the number of languages that instantiate um, that patterns. Um, and, and most of the order are actually attested, even if you see that some order are more frequent um, than other, like the English or the Thai pattern. And so there have been a number of theory that say that there is a, a, a common underlying structure that gets you to that, uh, to that type of, of pattern. Um, so that's a structure uh, like this one, which has been uh, proposed by uh, Jenny Culberson in the CLE uh, in Edinburgh and collaborators. Uh, where the, the adjective would be close uh, to the nouns, then the numeral, and then um, the demonstrative. It doesn't really matter whether it's in, in, in that order or, or it's in one direction or it's in the other uh, direction uh, here. So all the bolded order that you see in that graph, it, it can be generated by that structure. And the idea is that these patterns are more common because they have they actually come from this structure. So that's exactly what we call a distributional universal because this is, uh, as you see, not true for all language in the world, but it's like uh, very frequently observed. And this underlying structure would reflect the order of compositional operations. So the word order and the English term phrase, these two purple horses transparently reflect the order of compositional operations. So um, purple and then horse uh, combined together. And so they are adjacent. These apply to the combination of two purple horse and so is more uh, outside peripheral um, than the adjective purple relative to the base now. And um, there is evidence that linguistic humans have this bias to order these elements following the structure uh, when they are learning an artificial language and this independently of the ordering of the native language. So this is all the work of uh, Jenny Colbertson. Um, What's the origin of that type of structure? Uh, could it be that this is reflecting, in fact, the conceptual organization of complex concepts and that we can find the same organization in non-linguistic species? Can we find, in fact, these, these type of ordering preferences um, in baboons, for instance? So to test that, we focused on a simpler uh, test case, if you like, a true universal, because it's true in across uh, uh, all the world language. So when we describe this picture in English, we say uh, something like a purple horse and a bevelana. So we order the content word as uh, the feature that you see in that picture as purple horse and banana. In French, we would say un cheval violet et une banane. So horse, purple, banana. But in no language, you would order these elements in a sentence, uh, such as horse, banana, purple, where you would have banana that just comes in between the noun and um, the adjective that modifies it. Um, coming from what I've just told you previously, this is because word order would transparently reflect, in fact, compositional operation. So purple and horse combine together. And so there must be a just in the sentence that you are saying. So can baboons show similar ordering preferences? So we use the picture description task where we will actually measure in which order the baboons would report um, color, uh, the color and the shape feature of the display. So the task go like this. First, they learn to select the property that is matching a cue. So they see a cue. So here a yellow M letter. They see a response screen. So here purple or yellow. They have to tap yellow. So that's the type of color trials. They also have shape trials. 
This is the same Q, the yellow M letter, and this time the correct answer here is the M shape. Okay, and they have to learn this for um, nine different type of Q that are spanning a set across like uh, three different colors and uh, three different shapes. Once they learn this, they are presented with a more complex display like this one, where you have two colored shapes, so a yellow M letter and a purple arrow. And this time they are presented with four response buttons. And the task here is to choose the three correct response among the four. So here the three correct responses are M, purple, and yellow, because these are all the features that are instantiated in that display. So there are six correct sequences of three responses, which are all put here horizontally, okay? And out of the six, you have four where the color shape are uh, uh, the color shape of the same uh, of the same stimuli are uh, uh, contiguous. Uh, so that is to say, in that particular example, where uh, M and yellow are pressed contiguously uh, here. Uh, which is what you uh, expect if uh, participants have represented that type of display as yellow M letter, purple L. So what we measured here is uh, amount the, the, it's actually what's the proportion of correct response that follow this type of compositional pattern. Is it greater than change? So the change level here is um, two thirds. So that's the result, that's the proportion of contiguous color uh, shape response, and we see that baboons are above the change level. So they do prefer this type of compositional response as if, in fact, they would they have represented the this complex display as um, yellow M letter and purple arrow. So baboons decompose objects into the feature and they report the response in a compositional order. So this has important consequence. This suggests that there might be a natural syntax, in fact, of concepts that might be rooted in non-linguistic uh, mental representation. This is also more evidence for compositionality. Um, and, and, and with that type of, of, of study, it actually it opens the door so to many things. We could get, in fact, closer to the NP ordering um, that I showed you uh, uh, in the introduction of that part. Okay, um, that's not what we are going to do uh, next, but I want to say uh, something on a very recent study that we have done on another type of ordering um, across language, which is the agent-patient uh, ordering. So um, language tend to describe who is doing what to whom by placing agent before patient. That's true in 99% of the word language, which, are, uh, which order the subject before um, the object. And one question we may ask is similar, is that uh, whether that reflects a natural semantic organization of events. Uh, because ad human elbows have been shown, in fact, to place agent before patient in non-verbal uh, description. So when they are describing events using um, uh, invented gesture, uh, they are using um, pictures to describe events. And such a natural organization may actually come from, from something very basic actually, from just basic attentional process to focus more on agent than on patient. And it has been shown in fact that humans, uh, so both, both adults and infants, they tend to pay more attention to agents than to patient. Uh, in chasing interaction where you have a, like a chaser, um, the agent that is uh, running, uh, what well, that is chasing, uh, a chasey, uh, the patient. So like a, a kind of wolf and, and, and sheep um, relationship. And so with my PhD student, Flo Maris, um, we tested whether such attentional preference, which actually may be the root of just the natural semantic organization of, of event, may be present also um, in animals. Um, so we used a change detection paradigm where uh, Baboon would see uh, a small animation with two triangles that are just moving uh, on the screen. And the task is to tap the screen as soon as uh, they notice that one of the triangles change color. So here or here. 
And what we measure is their response time, depending on whether uh, the triangle is the one that is the agent of the small animation or the patient. And we predict that if they focus more on the agent type object, they should be faster uh, when it's the, uh, the chaser that changes color than when it's the chain that changes color. Okay, so let me show you what it looks like because it's uh, uh, easier to, to picture. So that's a chasing interaction that the baboon could see. So you have the two triangles, they go in a small animation. Boop, it changed color. It's super subtle, so I'm not, I'm not even sure that you, you've seen it. Uh, it's just really to, to force baboons just to, to pay attention to that. Um, so that's the chasing interaction. Uh, we, they also see uh, uh, some other type of animation, in fact, to, to control um, for, for them to not uh, focus more attention on some velocity profiles or the agent velocity profile more than the patient uh, velocity profile, but this independently of them being um, in an interaction. So they would see um, animation like this one where one uh, triangle behave like a chaser the other one behave like a cheesy, this one change color, uh, uh, and see whether there is a preference for any of the velocity profile, or is this something that is really linked to them being in an interaction. Um, another type of control that, um, that we have is to present them with another uh, types of interaction, which is that a following interaction where you have uh, this time, the agent that is the first object and not the second object, and the second one change color. Don't know if you saw it too. Uh, uh, this is to control for the fact that they don't have a preference for, uh, you know, the first uh, or the second object leading uh, an action. Um, so this is the response time uh, for each of these conditions. And what we found is that um, bourbons are just faster to detect the color change when it's the agent that changed color than when it's the patient in that chasing interaction. And this is was clearly not seen in any of the other conditions. We have a clear uh, significant interaction between um, what happens, what is the response time patterns during the chasing interaction. and the other um, condition. So what it shows is that baboons show um, an agent preference in chasing interaction, and this cannot be explained by just like, you know, the velocity profile, which is uh, that uh, we constructed for the agent and for the patient, because this really happened only when the agent and the patient that we created comes into uh, an interaction. Um, this has important consequence because uh, this is this, a similar attentional preference that is found in humans and baboons. But we can ask whether that holds uh, beyond chasing, which is a kind of particular uh, agent-patient interaction. And the question is that how we can go from this um, type of attentional bias to something which is more maybe representational. So having um, um, giving some kind of priority uh, or, or predominance to the agent in representation. Um, and this opens the way to lots of future works of how much of, of word or the patterns actually uh, could come from non-linguistic um, event representation, um, something that is very much linked to uh, one recent review um, that uh, Balthazar ha has published. So. It's been some time I'm talking now. Uh, so uh, let me uh, give you a general summary of all of that. So uh, I started with the question of how much of semantics and semantic computation can be explained uh, by uh, non-linguistic cognition. Um, I showed you like a first set of studies uh, on lexical meanings. If I can like um, roughly summarize the findings, I would say that baboons manipulate concepts of the same shape as ours, that is connected uh, concept, which might explain the type of lexical meanings that we find in languages. I showed you one set of study on compositionality that show that infant can compose mental representation before they are able to actually uh, probably understand complex sentences, but for sure to produce them. And baboons can respond to negation like uh, operators, suggesting that uh, uh, they can uh, both infants and baboons 
uh, uncertain compositional mental representation in the absence of um, constricted uh, language. Um, the third set of study was about word order. I showed you that baboons can report their response in a compositional manner. So that was the adjective now um, type of study. And that baboons show an agent bias, which is consistent with the prevalence subject order, uh, subject object order that we find in languages. So that suggests that the role that uh, some properties of language may actually come from um, very basic attentional uh, and perceptual process and the mental representation that might result from it. So it's true for connectedness, compositionality, uh, and world order. Um, for sure, yes, it does not mean that all of language, you know, can be found uh, in other species, and the, otherwise maybe they would have developed language, right? It's, so it, it's not. It's really not about that. It's, it's the question uh, that is interesting here is how much of language, and um, that question could be best, I think, answered by a comparative approach. I think it's really a necessary step that uh, needs to be undertaken, even in, in linguistics, because it hasn't been. Uh, Taken most uh, taken uh, very um, the, the similarity with other animals in terms of linguistic property hasn't been studied uh, a lot. Um, uh, so it, it's really a necessary step, really, to understand uh, how this uh, language capacity uh, might have evolved, and that's basically what we are trying to do um, now and in the future. So uh, I want to thank you, and I want also to thank my collaborator in particular. I want to acknowledge here Emmanuel Schemler, who has been working with me on most of the project that I presented you today, uh, as well as Joël Fago and uh, Nicolas Cledier, who are uh, running that uh, great experimental setup with the baboons, and uh, all my other uh, collaborators. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for an amazing talk, Isabel. That was, that was fantastic. Um, so um, we're now going to have questions from the um, panel and from our audiences online and in person. Um, so I'm going to go to the um, panel first. So I think we lost um, Steve, but Adele and Balthazar um, are both here. Uh, Adele, you've, you've, got your, you've got your camera on. <laughs> Can I come to you first? Um, take your comments and um, questions. Uh, okay. Um, thank you so much, Isabel. I uh, enjoyed this tremendously. Um, and and I, I really appreciate your general approach. I think it's exactly right. I, I wanted to um, ask whether you could connect the three parts a little more. So, you know, the what you called connectedness of lexical meanings seems to me to be true of objects, but not necessarily true of all lexical meanings. Like we have lots of, you know, we can name things like my favorite is the word appeal as a verb where there has to be a preceding court case that happened some time ago, somebody who was found guilty, blah, 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 blah. I don't know the sense, I mean, they're semantically connected, but, um, and, uh, but, con but the idea of um, connectedness could be uh, talked about in terms of maybe objects and then compositionality in terms of events or frames with open slots. Um, and then uh, word order kind of goes back to the idea of continuity, that it's easier to combine things that are next to each other, right? Like, so that doesn't seem independent of the first idea you were talking about. It's true. I think it's it's clearly true. So I actually did not uh, um, think much about word order as so being connect, like connected. Connected, connectedness. Oh, that's what, uh, but it's true that it's it's it it seems all about like proximity. Uh, but I just want to come back on the the, the first things that you said about connectedness not being applied to all words. I think it's very difficult for Kant words, and that's partly one of the reasons that we moved away from Kant words to go on the domain of quantifier, where you actually have like a like an actual definition of what it means in terms of relation between sets. So you can like, um, you have a precise definition of that 
for quantifier. For content word, it's a bit more fuzzy, I think. Um, um, but because you can always find dimension, you know, where things are connected and some words which are not connected. And the complicated things in that is to know whether people are actually finding the right dimension. So it looks, it, it's it's a bit circular as far as content words are, uh, are dealt with. That's why we moved on quantifier. So that, that's more or less my first uh, my first answer to the question. Then after to to just um, to this link between so compositionality, I I I am not sure that it's it's uh, it's really just about events because you can think about like that's that's true for the you know for the noun phrase cases for instance. That's not really an event like these two purple horses. Um, this is just like you're describing something that like you can describe an object like compositionality as well. So I think compositionality just apply to both events and just objects at the same time. So um, I'm not really sure how I can I, I can connect that, but I like the idea of thinking about word order as an idea of proximity in the same way as the connected stuff. So thanks for that. Okay. Um yeah, thank you. Um, uh, go ahead, Balthazar. Balthazar, go ahead. No, please feel free to follow up if you want to. Uh, well, I was uh, just thinking, you know, there are there are exceptions, of course, to most of the generalizations. Like, you know, if a language doesn't have a copula, you could imagine easily saying horse eating banana blue, right? Like where the word order isn't continuous it's you know the the grammar allows you to have discontinuous semantic constituents yeah yeah Robert, definitely you know yeah, yeah definitely it's just it's it, it's really it's really like i'm not really committed to that's what i said when i was describing this now this year it's just that even within a language that has been attested as x or y you find also discrepancy in that. Is it, and it's okay. I mean, it, 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 it's just about what's your favorite one? What's the one that you are using the most? If there is a reason why you are using this more than the other. That's right. Yeah. 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 So maybe this is actually a good point to uh, for me to jump in because I was also wondering about the word order study that you presented and to, to what extent. Um, it's really about the um, the composition, you know, just like as Adele also said about the connectedness and the proximity, and that in fact it might have to do something more with chunking. You know how you 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 put your things together. My the reason I'm asking this, my favorite counterexample to your you, you said like uh, in no language you can have horse banana purple. My favorite counterexample from for, the, for this kind of structures from Vietnamese where you can have like. The lone word cafe, you can insert cold in the middle. So literally, ga, cold, fe. I mean, it's an extreme case. <laughs> but the way of looking at this for me has always been in terms of like dual languages obey chunking constraints of prosodic wordhood or grammatical wordhood, uh, or uh, do they, it, you know, you, you, you spit out your syllables as you want and then you combine it uh, as you receive it in, uh, uh, and you plan the whole thing, but you don't necessarily plan exact the linearization as you have it in your hierarchical structure. So I was wondering whether it has more to do with the, uh, you know, the the chunking in the linear stream than truly compositionality. I am actually not committed to any hierarchical structure at all. Uh, in fact, um, it's just that conceptually, it's exactly. I think it goes also with uh, um, your way of chunking. It's just also a matter of what you you see in perception in that particular case, right? You see. Um, if you want to go at the extreme, you just see the um the so the yellow ambulature and the purple arrow as an example. But you could very well also just chunk it as a, an image if you want, more being something iconic that you stay in mind. Then you go from the first one, you tap, then you go in the second one, then you tap. Mm -hmm. That's that's also a possibility. And I mm -hmm. think that's why it's, it would be very nice to move to the NP ordering in that particular sense because it's it's a bit less clear how you would order like um, numerals, for instance, away uh, from like color and things. 
it's 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 a little bit unclear. So that I think that would be really interesting, uh, to go in these more finer grain cases where you could actually less rely on that type of like chunking mechanism, mm -hmm. which is fine. I'm like I'm 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 already happy with it. But it's like it's like if if we want to go more like in details of, uh, what the type of representation that allows you to do that, um, then finer grain cases would be good. Right, and in either way, it's interesting to probe its biological roots, right? Where it's, yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's cool. <laughs> can I ask also a question on the compositionality uh, part, uh, the, the thing on, on the negation? I thought that was really interesting. Uh, but I was wondering how you see this related to the uh, cases people have made on compositionality in the wild, so to speak, you know, in call combinations where you have you know, uh, a recruitment call, uh, an alarm call, and then it, it's uh, used as a mobbing uh, call or, uh, you know, the the Campbell monkey uh, uh, data and uh, or, or, or compounds yeah. of sorts that some people have argued that there are. How do you think this is related? Or is it not? So, or it's different? So, so I think that there, there have been like a, a, a good argument case for this Campbell monkey call. So it's basically they have two calls. They have A and B, uh, which means two independent things. And when you combine them together, then it means another like third thing. Uh, and basically, this cannot really, we cannot really know whether that's the case of compositionality because you can very well uh, argue that this A and B all together form like a holistic unit that is mapped onto a neural meaning. So you don't know whether the meanings can actually come from the, the past. I think the closest we can get for like a compositional behavior is something that has been shown with Japanese teeth birds. Yes. Uh, where you have like kind of A and B call that are that are put together and the combination is like it's some of A and it's some of B, something like that. It's not functional in the sense of negation because it's still uh, conjunctive. Like I can, um, yeah, it's still conjunctive. It's not like functional in the sense that it's, it's 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 an it's an operation so but it seems to me that's the closest we can get for, for now as far as i know it at least mm -hmm. the closest we can get from some some type of compositionality in um, animal communicative system um the step that we are taking here is that we are showing that there, there could be instances where it's actually non-conjective that is more like a font like an application of function which is more like the what uh, semantics has been put yeah. like the the definition of composition mm -hmm. is from mm -hmm. semantic standards. No, I agree with with the, with the Japanese tits and and other birds. It's it's exactly that, right? It could be conjunctive. Um, the gamble monkey, arguably, that case could not be because that element doesn't you know hasn't doesn't have independent meaning. It's more. But yeah, I agree. It's like we we don't we, we don't know the exact semantics, so it's hard to say. Yeah. That's always the tricky part with animals is that there is an additional layer yes. of difficulty to know like what's the meaning of it, uh -huh. and that that makes it complicated after for that type of question. Mm -hmm. so. That's great, thanks, guys. I'm going to take um, a couple of questions from the room. First one's from um, Simon. Do you want, do you want to say I think if you if you speak loudly, it should pick you up. Oh, okay, <laughs> and can you hear me? Okay, Isabel. I can hear you. Okay, I will. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll speak. I'll speak loudly. Um, firstly, absolutely fantastic work. Um, it's uh, a, what a cavalcade of delights to see all of those experiments. Um, um, and I'm, of course, I've got about ten questions here, so I have to pick pick amongst them. Um, I was wondering about the um, compositionality result, particularly the negation finding. So I look at that and think of that in terms of simplicity. So your task where you uh, where one where it's inconsistent, uh, the to actually learn that system, the system has to be described in more complex terms than uh, where it's consistent. And I actually think that's a strength of that result and suggests, as I feel, that compositionality falls out of simplicity. But I wanted to test that that prediction 
you need to do the reverse case where the plus didn't mean negation, but meant uh, whatever the opposite of negation is. And I wondered if you'd run that. So when the plus appears, then you, you click on the same thing. And when the plus doesn't appear, then you click on the other things and see if the you get the same the the same extra difficulty when it's inconsistent. Have you tried that? No, uh, we did not. Um, we thought about it at some point, um, and I, I I can't remember what the, was the history uh, of that. But we we did not. The, the thing is that I that I missed in your question, which was crucial, is why that was necessary. <laughs> Uh, because that that would show that so formally um, the case where plus means negation or plus means not negation uh, uh, they're essentially identical in terms of their complexity um, so you should still find an advantage for the case for, for where that applies consistently across all of the objects versus yeah. the case where it doesn't apply in one of them because the case where it doesn't apply in one of them, you have to just wrote, memorize all of the all of the instances. I mean, I'm assuming it would work just as well. And that would be, I don't think it would be, I think it would support compositionality, but it would also support simplicity as the kind of root driver behind this. And actually, I think also the connectedness result and with a little bit of um, hoops jumped through the case of the the last case where where you have the colors and shapes mapping yeah no i i, I agree i agree that was the case there um so we, we 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 actually thought about doing this um for, for for that very reason and now i recall that we did we did not do it because um well, afterwards, just because also the testing is limited, uh, that's a constraint, like technical constraint. But uh, we decided we decided to go with the case that I presented you, just because it's iconically it was just making more sense to have like a simple shape for the identity and just have a more complex thing for the more complex. Thing. But I agree with what, what you said, and I I can imagine that it would work in the same way. Um, we want also to run like extension of that on uh, looking at several applications of the same function, which I think would be cool. Um, yeah, but yeah, I agree. I'm going to take an online question, then I'll come. Then I'll come back to the room, possibly for for your next question, Simon. <laughs> but okay, so the the question from online is from Kate McCurdy. So she says, "Great talk. Uh, I think which I think we all agree with." Um, as Steve uh, seems to have dropped out. Um, I'll ask a big picture question in, in, in this vein. Given your findings about semantic primitives, how would you say this work relates to or possibly challenges accounts of the semantics developed in large language models, which which I think she's assuming don't have those primitives? For example, the relational semantics accounts that Steve has worked on. For instance, do we think there's sufficient evidence from language alone to establish the connectedness of quantifiers such that we expect to see similar behavior there? That would be cool, actually, to test. I would be happy, very happy. Like I think also, like so, I I, I do some like uh, um comparative work, but I think one element that needs to be added to that is just to test whether the models are just able to just have these things, uh, also with just um, the linguistic input, and um, I think that's interesting because we go in two extreme of the continuum, you know, like one model that just have linguistic input and. Uh, animals that do not have anything if they both converge that's funny um well funny um that would be interesting um but i think it's 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 complementary uh definitely and i would be very happy for people to just work at these property uh in language model i think it has been done for compositionality with this uh, recent lake and uh, uh barony uh paper that shows that actually uh, large language models can have uh, compositional uh, compositionality. I did not look in details in that paper, so I don't know in which uh, which uh, level of compositionality they are just talking about. Whether there's something that is purely conjunctive, or this is something that which is more function uh, like function application. Um, but I think it's it's like yeah, people started actually to look at that. So it's good. Yeah, I think our recent experiences is that so think of Vlad. Your your recent modeling works that neural networks have extremely strong like preferences for 
connected concepts that are actually quite hard to get rid of. So that might that might be a general property of um, things that learn fast, generalize fast. Um, another question from the room. Go on, Simon. All right, I'm, I'm going oh, to come up. Bit of I'm going to come a bit further forward. Um, so, I'm, I, this is a little bit more challenging after saying lots of nice things. <laughs> um, I was, I, I am a little bit baffled by what exactly the claim is from the infant results on compositionality. So, so I was thinking. Whenever I see a result like that, I sort of wonder what what would you have said if the result had gone the other way? And I was thinking, if 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 infants hadn't been surprised, then you would say, well, infants have to learn uh, this compositional structure of the world. But that also wouldn't be a bad result for the claim you're trying to make that language uh, 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 compositionality in language. Um, isn't innate, which is essentially what you're claiming, right? So, so that means I'm not entirely sure how that result helps you or hinders you. So, I mean, obviously the world is full of functions and full of composition, um, and presumably we, we, and I would have thought all animals have to be able to cope with that, and they have to be able to learn it. So, how does this really speak to the the claims you're making about language one way or the other. Yeah, so I think that's an excellent point, which is that uh, there is kind of a missing link between what we observe in uh, non-linguistic domain and uh, what what is there in, in language. If I may to say, actually, we have very little knowledge of com like how compositionality develops in language itself, even in the first year. It's surprisingly, um, being very not really well investigated uh, in that sense. Of, in that sense, so I, I think that's a great question. I, I don't have I don't have much answer for that particular point. What my point was for this non linguistic stuff is that even this, which you would assume it's it's true, and uh, and that like infants should learn about function in the world and things. Um, the, the, yeah, they surely should learn about function, but can they? Uh, can they have that computational um, mechanism that actually uh, link uh, uh, like functions uh, together? I mean, uh, we did not know about about this before. And in fact, the, the work that uh, Steve did with uh, Dick Aslin was a kind of suggesting that, well, they, they cannot do it. So that's more the added value that, okay, and the non-linguistic domain in function, like using function that they know, this they can do it. But the, I agree that the, the 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 big question after that is how this is linked to their compositional ability in language. So we are trying to develop that. Adele, did you want to come in? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So I, it's sort of a two part question. One is that I don't know if you remember that old um, science paper about bees. But it was almost like they uh, generalized and composed meanings, or or at least in, understood sort of negation, in a way that's more general than humans. So it, the the basic finding was that if you had like vertical lines at one entry point, they would look and and they found food at vertical lines um, down the path, then they would ex on the next round when they were put in the same kind of uh, container, they would they would go from same to same. So whether that was like lemon smell to lemon smell. So they would learn if A, then A. And then uh, when they did it again, with if if the vertical lines went to horizontal lines, they would then choose to go from lemon to orange. So these were honeybees, incredible. And so what, what it makes me wonder is whether the compositionality that humans use is actually much more nuanced and specific. So I, I never really understand what people mean by compositionality, except by appealing to constructions. Like combining an adjective and noun is a very different thing than combining a verb and an object or or a you know a, a WH word and the rest of the sentence. Like it, the way we combine words to form a more um a larger meaning, a more complex meaning, 
relational meaning depends on the construction. So kids have to learn construction. So the real question is, how do they do that? And, and they have to learn a lot of different construction. Um, they're earning bees. They're, it's a great case. I, 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 I love the bees. We are doing some experiments on the bees right now. So uh, it, it's really cool. Um, there is a, a, a little bit difference with, with what you're saying because it, it's the same and different stuff. So they have to learn like one symbol means same and the other that means different. But it's, it's, it's actually not alternating. So either they learn same or yeah, yeah. they learn different. It's right. never like intermix. And that's the same also with animals, with infants, when they are tested on this um, relation match to sample or non-relation match. It, it's, it's, it's exactly always the same. These are separated. So we, we cannot be sure that um, they actually form something like not same rather than different. You see what I mean? It's, it's like, it's not, it's, it's not necessary in that case that you have some type of compositional representation. It could be just something like completely all the same. Um, so that was for my first point about about the bees and all of these studies about same and and and, and different. Well, and the, the second point, so what's the difference between not same and different? Uh, well, you can you you can have just a representation of 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 like it's the same as with the logical reasoning task where I said like absent and present that could be just separate thing for us it's like super complex to say sure, but true. you can have like representation that are maintained but separately that are not related to each other there's no logical connection between and between between them so that was for the first point the second point was about like um learning uh, construction and i think yes that's that is something that um, that surely needs to be explored uh in in the sense of of the development of linguistic compositionality is how this disability might develop with perhaps like like different construction that that kids might may be learning and things and i think this hasn't been done at all actually just looking at their compositional ability from well like I did not see it like in very like I see it much later, but like it's true from like uh the the age from age three and so on. But the thing is that the the age range that also interests me is like what happens between the time that the kids are shown to understand like single word units, you know, like six months they do understand like a few words from that stage after. It's like all that stage here, it's like, what happened there? Does it mean that they are learning words, but they are not able to combine them at all? That's, yeah, that's all. That's, that's, that's what I just wanted to say, that it hasn't been done in that particular age range. No. <laughs> Folks, I hate, I, hate to, I hate to draw this to a close, but we're out of time. So I have to let everyone um, head off to be, con to be continued um, next week when we that magic organization by somebody else. Uh, the, our, our speaker next week is Balthazar, who's going to be talking about um, biases and language evolution. So um, same time um, next Monday. Thanks again, Isabel, for a fantastic talk. Thanks. That was a great talk. Great discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Yeah. Cheers, folks. That was brilliant. Thanks, Isabel. Bye, guys. Bye.